Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to St Mary's Vicarage in Sixpenny Handley on this Tuesday, the 9th of June. Lovely to see you all this morning. Good morning, Jenny. Good morning, Danny. Good morning, uh, Bill. Um, reasonably pleasant day outside today here in Handley. Good morning, Paul. Uh, morning, Gita. Lovely to see you all. So, uh, I've just finished... Uh, I've just finished a Zoom meeting with um, uh, Bishop Karen, our area bishop, and um, some of our Rural Hope uh, team, my fellow RFOs. And um, uh, we've been discussing a, um, a new exciting initiative, um, which is um, developing um, sort of outdoor prayer spaces in churches um, or churchyards. Um, partly to sort of deal with the issue that, uh, morning Ian, morning uh, Gemma, uh, partly to deal with the issue that of course our churches are um, locked for the moment. Uh, that may change, we're all in a bit of limbo at the moment. Um, government says one thing <coughs> and the um, hierarchy uh, in the national church say something else. So we, we're not quite sure where we are with all of this at the moment. Uh, morning um, uh, Michelle, morning Annie and Mike. Um, so it, it does look like our church doors might be able to open at some point in the next few weeks, but um, uh, worship is unlikely. It's also interesting that in a discussion, a Zoom meeting I had yesterday with several other incumbents, um, I am getting feedback from uh, them that um, some of the smaller rural churches uh, church wardens there are very nervous about um, reopening churches and having to implement the, the quite strict protocols that will be required and have said that they're not going to open the not going to open their churches that's none in our benefice but this is with my other sort of hat on as a field officer for Dorset um, and there are sort of concerns about that. So quite sort of challenging times. Morning, uh, John. Anyhow, the, the project we were discussing this morning with Bishop Karen is this idea that because, um, you know, churchyards can be places of refre re reflection and lots of our churches do have covered porches. So we have one here at Handley and at um, Pentridge is the idea is to try and create a sort of a prayer space um, within those areas where people can sit and reflect and maybe do different things. Some churches have put um, a pile of stones that can be made into a khan or a prayer board or just some items for reflection. Um, so that initiative was discussed this morning and we're going to launch that in the in the diocese as a sort of a um, something that we would do in any case, but also uh, a sort of preamble into um, hopefully opening up our churches. But um, this will allow people to at least um, have some time of reflection or help to prompt some time of reflection within our um, churchyards and um, church porches. So um, sounds uh, interesting um, and uh, we'll see how that develops. Good morning, Harry. Good morning, Sally. Good morning, Peter. Um, so that's what I've been doing this morning. I I'm one Zoom meeting down. Uh, uh, this is a whole week of Zoom meetings. <laughs> Anyhow, um, today uh, on the 9th of June, uh, coming back to this book here, Exciting Holiness, the sort of uh, book of all of our sort of saints and people in the Church of England we remember. Uh, but today the church gives thanks for the life of Co Columba of Iona. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever been to the Iona community. It's a place I've wanted to visit for some years. Um, I did sign up to a, a, a trip a few years back, but sadly it got cancelled because there wasn't enough interest um, in it. Um, but a lot of the uh, Iona community at the moment produce a lot of wonderful worship and Celtic worship. And um, a few weeks ago we used their Celtic morning prayer and my suggestion uh, on Sunday, my suggestion is we're going to use that form of Celtic service again this coming Sunday. Um, but a little bit about Iona. <clears throat> um, born in Ireland in about the year 521, Columba was trained as a monk by St Finian and then founded several monasteries himself, including probably that of Kells, before leaving Ireland to settle on Iona off the coast of Scotland. He was accompanied by 12 companions, 
and the number grew as the monastic life became more established and well known. Columba <coughs> seems to have been an austere and at times a harsh man who reputedly uh, mellowed with age. He was concerned with building up both the monasteries and its life of enabling them to be instruments of mission in a heathen land. He converted kings and built churches. Iona became a starting point for the expansion of Christianity throughout Scotland. In the last four years of his life, uh, when his health had failed, he spent time transcribing books of the Gospels for them to be taken out and used. He died on this day in the year 597. So we remember Iona um, today. <clears throat> Uh, now, yesterday was my day off. Um, I had quite an interesting day. I went um, up to Bristol. Uh, it's a place I, I visit um, quite regularly. Uh, interestingly enough, the last time I was there, I think, was literally two or three days before the lockdown um, began. Um, and even in my previous parish, uh, I would go there quite often. It was just straight down the M4 from my previous parish. Here it's a little bit more of a pleasant country drive. Um, and it's a it's a fabulous city. If you don't know Bristol, it's um, really changed over the years. I think in the last uh, 20 plus years or so, it's smartened itself up um, hugely. Um, I mean, it, it, it was a bit of a dump in the past. I mean, the whole dock area when it was undeveloped and such like was a was a real mess. But um, they've done an incredible job in uh, Bristol. And uh, it's a fascinating city. And also, some of you may have caught the um, uh, programme on BBC Two, um, A House in Time, which is featuring a house at 10 Guinea Street in um, Bristol. It's on BBC Two on uh, iPlayer or Catch Up. Do watch it. Fascinating um, uh, programme with a historian who is also local to, um, to Bristol. Um, so it's a place I've enjoyed visiting just socially, but also as a photographer, because I think it's a fascinating city to photograph both for street photography and other bits and pieces. So I went there yesterday, uh, driven by two things. One, to sort of go back, I just felt um, I've been doing so much rural landscape photography recently. I felt it. I, I needed a bit of sort of tarmac and concrete. And um, and also because of the protests uh, that had happened there over the weekend, I thought it'd be interesting to uh, to go back and visit. So I spent the day um, walking around the streets uh, of Bristol. I think I must have walked about my little thing. I reckon I walked about six, seven miles in the end uh, and got some good photographs. I posted some of those up last night. Um, I, I, there's a collection there that I've been doing over a year. Um, but yeah, very interesting city with some very interesting people to chat to. And of course, um, I was talking to people yesterday very much in the aftermath of the protests that had happened there uh, over the weekend. And it was very interesting. And I, I spoke to several people whose um, background was from Afro-Caribbean uh, origin. Uh, also got to take their portraits as well. I was like, enjoy taking uh, portraits. But it was very interesting. The first conversation I had was with a, a lovely chap called um, Jim, who um, he's been living in Bristol for, for 17 years and um, I think is technically homeless. Um, and um, the conversation started off when he, he asked me for some money and I generally said, well, I don't have any money on me because everything's shut. So there's no point in bringing uh, money. Anyhow, we, we had a good old conversation about um, things. It was very interesting that he had sort of um, mixed views about the protests and things. I mean, of course, he was in favour of them, uh, but he was really quite alarmed at, at the sort of some of the violence that that was happening. I should say that um, his particular belief as well, he was a Rastafarian. So he spoke a little bit about um, that. Uh, I then met another wonderful character wandering uh, around uh, the streets, uh, fantastically um, dressed. Um, he was, funny enough, he didn't have a camera on him, but he was also a photographer and artist. Again, uh, another uh, um, chap from a sort of Afro-Caribbean -Car background. And um, he, his view was quite interesting in the sense that um, he uh, fully supported, obviously, the, the protests of Black Lives Matter, but um, he didn't think the sort of, uh, physical removal of the statue of Edward uh, Colston um, was the right thing to do. 
And uh, we both sort of had a discussion on the fact that there has been a petition in Bristol to remove that statue um, for many, many years. The, the trouble is, if you know Bristol well, the name Colston is plastered on just about every building you can think. Um, and I think that's the trouble with, in a sense, uh, how we have to come to terms with our history as nations. Um, excuse me, I'm just going to, because I'm just being a bit blinded by how we come to terms with our history as nations. And, um, you know, of course, it's very interesting. I, I did get to the plinth that no longer has Colston's statue on it and um, took a couple of interesting photographs there. There's still some placards up and such like, and a lot of media people were, uh, were there. But it is interesting, in a sense, when you think about it, regardless of, of whether we think it was right or wrong for people to physically remove the statue in that way. It is quite an odd thing when we think about the fact that it, in a very key part of a modern uh, 21st century city is a large statue of somebody who, yes, was very philanthropic. He built a lot of schools and did a lot of things um in bristol is that he was a very wealthy man but all of his money was made uh by slave trading and um by uh the suffering of other human beings so in a sense this this is the problem about it's a bit like sort of skeletons in our closet isn't it about like things personally we maybe have done in the past um are there things in our own life that, that we have done that may have resulted in some good, but we might be quite ashamed for them? Would we really want to put them on a plinth? <laughs> and I think that's the dilemma that we have today, in a sense, and that uh, not just our country, but particularly in a sense, we, we've got to somehow come to terms with our history. We can't hide it because I think that's just as bad. I think just to remove and take down statues and just to pretend those people didn't exist, it is actually probably a worse thing to do than actually leave the statues there. Uh, and in the conversations I had yesterday, I think there, there does need to be something about, in a say, acknowledging that this is part of our history in the past, okay? And that uh, cities like Bristol, a lot of the money and the wealth that came into that city um, was involved with the slave trade. However, at the same time in our country, um, you know, every time we sing that wonderful hymn, Amazing Grace, um, we need to think of those pioneers, those, those clergy and people who um, uh, fought tooth and nail for the abolition of slavery in this country. And it was a very, very hard um, fought battle. You only need to look at the history of it. So we need to keep both those things um, in balance, that yes, there were people, even the church, I mean, at the time of the abolition of slavery, a bishop from the Church of England wrote a treaty using the Bible to justify why slavery was acceptable. It, clearly had nothing to do with the fact that he also had lots of money invested in the slave trade. Um, so, you know, we've got to get this, our history, and we've got to acknowledge what our history is. I'm not sure also about the fact of repenting for things that people did centuries ago. You know, I don't feel it's my position to apologize for the slave traders in the past. That, that was their problem. I do feel it's my duty to highlight what the reality of history is and what we can learn from it. I think that's really uh, important. So it's interesting that the mayor of Bristol and some people have suggested dredging up uh, dear Edward's statue from, um, <laughs> from the dock and not putting it back on the plinth and putting it um, in a museum but putting it in a museum with context and the historian who is doing this wonderful program about 10 Guinea Street, who is also from um, uh, Caribbean origin, um, though he's a Brit born in England, his, uh, I think his parents emigrated here. Um, you know, he makes this point actually that it, what happened on Sunday was history. You know, 
the, the, the plinth was dragged down by protesters. That is history. And in a sense, that needs to be taught and the context needs to be understood. And the idea that that statue should end up in a museum and the full history of this individual should be explained and where we are today. To me, that makes a lot of sense. Um, that plinth, has, that statue has been in the middle of Bristol for years. And if you've ever gone and looked at it, it's got very interesting things around it. But it makes no mention anywhere that uh, Colston was involved with uh, slavery. And it would have been interesting, in a sense, to have had the original statue there, but maybe a more modern day sort of plaque or thing in front of it that actually gave the real history of Colston and what he was involved with. The good stuff he did, but how he paid for it as well. Um, and I think that's that is the challenge for us. Um, you know, the history of the church is not spotless either by any stretch of the imagination. And you've already heard me wax lyrical about um, uh, the situation of um, prejudice uh, within the church today. That too will become history. Um, I, wonder, I wonder if we can actually learn something from our German brothers and sisters. Because in Germany, of course, um, they have a very difficult modern history, a very difficult modern history. And uh, if you talk to Germans, if you have German friends who talk to Germans, my experience of them is they don't tend to shy away from that. They acknowledge the history that they have and they have tried to learn from it. And that for me is the, the beauty and the purpose of history. What can we learn from it? It's also been interesting that there's been uh, pictures of people vandalising the cenotaph in London and elsewhere. To me, this actually says the problem when we don't teach history properly, when history no longer becomes a compulsory subject in school or when we teach history in a particular way. I wonder how many of those people vandalising the cenotaph in London or trying to set fire to the flags actually really understand what that monument represents. I know it's from the First World War, but it also has a huge link with the uh, Second World War as well. And of course, it's really important to remember that the men and women who gave their lives, who are also on our local village war memorials, um, gave their lives to fight against the biggest rise of the supreme movement of white supremacy, which was Nazism. And had they succeeded, um, our country would not have coloured people, it would not have Jewish people, it would not have gay people. Um, uh, that was the way that the uh, Nazi movement um, was there. So this is the issue with history. It's really important that we teach our young people history and we don't put stuff in the closet. We don't ignore what some of these people have done. We need to, um, you know, be open about that and actually say that you know, by today's standards and today's measurements, what they did was absolutely fundamentally wrong. It was wrong back then, but the culture that they were living in was very, very different. And we need to try and understand the mindset of that. But then we also need to be proud of the bits in history, like the abolition of slavery, which this country and um, <coughs> clergy and politicians um, in the United Kingdom um, really took a lead on. Um, so it's it it's a difficult one. It's a difficult one. Anyhow, if you want to have a look at the pictures of Bristol, um, uh, they're up on the my Facebook page. Uh, you can go to the site there. So um, yeah, uh, interesting, interesting one. So today's reading, gospel reading, uh, comes from the Gospel of Matthew and uh, chapter five, beginning to read at verse 13. Jesus said to his disciples, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt becomes tasteless, what can make it salty again? It is good for nothing and can only be thrown out to be trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hilltop cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp to put it under a tub, but they put it on a lampstand where it shines for everyone in the house. In the same way, your light must shine in the sight of men, so that seeing your good works, they may give praise to your Father in heaven. 
it's a beautiful passage um, that um, you are the salt of the earth. And whenever I read that passage, it, it makes me reflect on my own Christian journey and pilgrimage. And um, it makes me particularly think of the times I felt particularly salty <laughs> and the times I felt particularly tasteless. And um, I think that is the thing about the Christian faith and the Christian um, the Christian pilgrimage it, it is in that sense. What do we do in those times when we we feel that we're not fully seasoned, um, so to speak? Uh, and I have to say that, you know, in this time of lockdown, that that's been a real challenge um, as a minister and as one that, um, you know, I've, I strongly feel, you know, I'm a mission uh, evangelist and a missioner that to not be able to be out and working and having our churches opening and working with other groups and developing new projects and reaching out to uh, communities and trying to um, help people, help people improve people's lives, both spiritually and practi practically, has, has been really difficult. I mean, it's been great to sort of be doing these live broadcasts and such like, but I have felt, you know, um, and there's been particular days um, when I have just felt that the, the saltiness drain from me. Um, and that, I think that's a real challenge for all of us. I think all of us can have days like that, weeks or sometimes even months, when we just feel the salt of life, the salt of our spirituality um, has disappeared. And we can sit there and think, you know, what's it all about and, and, and what's going on? Um, but that, I think, is part of the pilgrim journey. And um, my experience of the journey in the past is, has, has, when this happens has, has been twofold, two things. Sometimes it just requires patience. Um, I think sometimes we go through what some people would call a desert experience. We can go through experiences when we feel that God is not present in our lives, is very distant in our lives and there can be all sorts of reasons um, for that which I won't go into but the feeling is very re real and we can sort of wonder you know where where is God um, and, and it can feel like we've lost our faith well we haven't lost our faith because if we'd lost our faith we wouldn't be in a sense seeking God <laughs> if you see what I mean if you'd lost your faith you'd just say well fair enough I'll just get on I'll just find something else to do the trouble the problem that it worries us so much is because we are people of faith and in a sense, that feeling and that presence of God sometimes doesn't feel with us. So sometimes it's patience. We just have to keep treading and plodding that road. And eventually we will come over a hill or we will go around a corner and we will have another encounter um, with the living God. Uh, and then other times it's about sometimes doing deliberate things to in a sense try and reinvigorate us um, in our spiritual journey um, I might call it the sort of kindle mint cake thing uh, if any of you are sort of into fell walking or hill walking or something like that um, you know you get to a point on a long walk when you can get really really tired and um, your energy levels are very very low and you start to think why on earth did I set out on this walk in the first place I could have been at home reading a book or something else and you start to get very low like that and it's normally because your sugar levels have dropped well there's that wonderful stuff kendall mint cake um uh, or some people take boiled sweets or something like that and um if you're walking you chew on a bit of kendall mint cake or something like that and um it boosts your sugar levels up um so in a sense we need to find the spiritual equivalent of um of kendall mint cake and, and that might be going back to some of the gospel passages or the passages in the Bible that have meant a lot to us on our Christian journey. Going and rereading those specific passages and hearing those words again. It might be, in a sense, um, just spending some time um, away from the busyness of life in prayer and reflection. Or talking to another Christian, talking to another fellow pilgrim and sharing the the trauma of the journey because that's another thing you know if you do if you go walking it's always better if you're walking with people even if you spend time on your own because then when you're feeling a bit down and the walk's getting a bit tough 
Sometimes a conversation with a fellow pilgrim, a fellow walker helps to move us on the way. And then the other thing I find is to be is try to be focused. Um, when I'm on a long, hard walk and it starts to get like that, even if the Kendall mint cake hasn't quite kicked in, I start to think of the very nice hot cup of tea or beer I'm going to have at the end of the journey, that there is going to be uh, something there. So in a sense, that that feeling that our saltiness can go, that feelingness that that God sometimes can feel distance is a very real experience for us as Christians. I've had it many time on my uh, pilgrim journey. Um, but there are ways, partly being patient uh, and partly, in a sense, trying to find out what our spiritual Kendall Mint cake is um, that will uh, reinvigorate us and um, spur us on uh, to continue to walk that, um, that Christian journey, that pilgrim road. Anyhow, that was a lovely passage um, this morning. So uh, let's have a time of prayer. I'm just going to um, have the prayer for uh, St Columba this morning and then a few, uh, just a few prayers. Almighty God, who filled the heart of Columba with the joy of the Holy Spirit and with deep love for those in his care, may your pilgrim people follow him, strong in faith, sustained by hope and one in the love that binds us to you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer today. We pray, Lord, for our nation and we pray, Lord, for, for those who feel that they are not receiving justice within our land. We pray, pray for those who feel marginalised, for those who feel persecuted, for those who feel oppressed. We pray, Lord, that we may live in a land where everybody is celebrated, where human achievement can, uh, and ingenuity can be celebrated by all, and all people from all backgrounds can be encouraged on that journey of life. We pray, Lord, for the history of this land, for the many dark parts of our history, but also thanksgiving for the many positive and good parts of the history of this nation. We pray, Lord, that we may learn from the history of the past, that we may not hide that which is bad, that we may celebrate what is good, and that we may acknowledge and understand the context in which we find ourselves. We continue to pray, Lord, for those who are battling coronavirus, those who are unwell. We give thanks that uh, in Dorset that there has been uh, no deaths for a couple of days. And we pray also, um, Lord, for our schools, for those uh, children back at school at the moment and for those still at home. We pray, Lord, for our scouts uh, locally. And we give thanks for the scout meeting online uh, last night. And we pray, Lord, for the people of Scotland today as we remember St Columba, we pray for the Iona community, those who live and work there and all that they give to the wider church. And we pray, Lord, today that you will invigorate us, that we may truly be lamps that shine and that times in our Christian pilgrimage, when we feel distant from you, when we feel that the saltiness has gone, that you will invigorate us with your Holy Spirit to continue on that pilgrim road. We ask all this in Jesus Christ, your son. Amen. So uh, thanks for joining me uh, this morning. Um, lovely to uh, be with you again. I hope you have a, a good day, whatever you're doing. Um, I've got quite a few Zoom meetings and some admin to do today. I'm also looking at the Vicarage lawn, which looks beautiful because it's got a lot of wildflowers on it. We keep one part um, that we don't mow at all and we just let the wildflowers grow but the other bit does need mowing. So I think at some point I am gonna to have to get the mower out and have a go at the vicarage, uh, front vicarage lawn. Anyhow, um, whatever, um, whatever you're doing today, I uh, hope you have a really positive day. Um, let's just close with the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. <laughs>